Do you guys know what uh, heavy metal is? Heavy metal, what it is, what it means? It's a magazine, yes. A <laughs> fantasy magazine. Is it still in print? I was going to say, is it still in print? No, yeah. I don't think so. But uh, a heavy metal is basically uh, a metal that has a big core. As we go down here, the core of the elements get more and more atoms in them, and as they get heavier and heavier, they tend towards, you know, stuff like radioactivity and everything as the, the nucleus get bigger. So basically the general idea is as the metal get bigger, they also get more toxic for us. For example, cadmium is, is a metal, and you need in your body cadmium just like you need iron, but you need very, very little bit. If you're working with cadmium pigments, okay, and this is getting into your body, whether it's from paint or from pigment, what's happening is the cadmium from the pigment is staying inside your body, which raises, you know, the level of metal that you have inside of you. And this is whether it's a, if it's paint, and you get it on your fingers like that, or if it's pigment and you're breathing it, it amounts to the same. When you get these heavy metals inside of you, then they just sit there and it makes you more at risk for diseases such as cancer, lip pain, <coughs> kidney failure, that kind of stuff, because cadmium will stay there. Uh, they, some of it gets eliminated, but it will stay there for a long time. So when you are working with artist paints, you should know about which ones, which metals are toxic, even if you're never working with pigments. And how can you know what pigments you are working with? Say you are buying good paint. How can you know? Do you guys know? Does it usually say toxic or non-toxic on the paint? Yeah, it <laughs> says I, it says that, right? It says toxic or non-toxic. Are you talking to the AP non-toxic seal? Is that the one? The one that looks a little bit like an octagon with AP and CP? Mm -hmm. That's right. It's true that it says so. But suppose you wanted to be more educated than, you know, <laughs> reading a label. What would you do? Well, isn't it more toxic as thick the paint is? Because um, if it's a heavy metal, wouldn't it be um, like a thicker color? Not necessarily, because uh, you can pin it down a lot. So the thickness of the paint doesn't, I mean, it could be an indication of how much pigment is in there, but not necessarily, you know, not necessarily. It depends on the paint. The, uh, the price tag of the paint actually is probably a better indication of how much pigment is in there. You know, if you're buying more expensive paint, there's a good chance there is more pigment there. So how could I know what's inside of my tube or if it's toxic for me? What would be the starting point, do you think? The name. The name. That's great. So was that your answer no. to it? Maybe, well, I don't know if that's right, but looking at the ingredients. I'm you sorry? You look at the ingredients and if you find metal, you know that it is toxic. Everybody get that? The name and the ingredients. Well, first she said the name and she's right. Uh, because if you have the name cadmium yellow, then there's a good chance cadmium yellow is inside of that tube. But in order to be absolutely sure, because sometimes companies will label the tube cadmium yellow, but it's not necessarily cadmium yellow that is in there. You need to look at the ingredients. And pigments have, if you've seen the sheets that I passed around with the watercolor, you'll see watercolor with PY35 watercolor with PG7 and watercolor with PB36. What are those numbers? PY and PG. I think they're like pigment numbers. They're pigment numbers, exactly. And every pigment has a number. And the sheet that I brought for Ginny to copy to you has a list of all the pigments that are like fast enough to make artist paints with their numbers. So that way, you can know exactly what's inside of you too. Because 
we are required as paint manufacturers to actually list these numbers on the tube. We're not required to call the color name the same name as the pigment inside, but we're required to put the pigment numbers on the tube. So if you wanted to know if you have toxic pigment inside of your tubes, the, the place to start would be to, to read these numbers and to know a little bit about these numbers, especially if you guys, you know, you guys are young, you're starting, you know, basically, and you're going to be doing this for a long time. So these are the things that you should learn about right now. You know, cadmium yellow, pigment yellow 35. If the tube says cadmium yellow, but it says pigment yellow number three, then it's a U. It's not cadmium yellow because cadmium yellow is yellow 35. And that they can't lie about. They can call the tube whatever they want, but the, the ingredients inside has to be accurate. Jean, just look at this book. Do I count in the uh, white? I'm the only one selling that because nobody is really interested in stocking this. Some of some of our resellers do actually buy it uh, in Quebec City, but uh, not so much, not so much. But you don't need to have that to make it. You can make it with just this. Absolutely. If you're really enthusiastic about making paint and you really feel you should, then you should. But this is maybe $9.95. That's all you need, $9.95. You don't need to buy this because that's expensive. It's handmade. But if the traditional tool, you can demonstrate it later. All right. So which pigment do you think are hazardous to your health? Cadmium, <laughs> all the cadmium compounds. The metallic ones, but like I said, some some of the inorganic ones containing metal are toxic. Now, everybody agrees, okay, because you were saying rust is toxic, and everybody agrees, I think, that even a non-toxic pigment like rust, if, if you're eating up a tube, it's going to make you sick. But as per, you know, general use, general good use, iron oxide is not toxic, but, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it's a matter of quantity too, you know. You can't go and, you know, do these crazy things with pigment and say, oh, he told me it's not toxic, because I, I've seen that as well. But in the general regard of the state, iron oxide is one of them. Cadmium is toxic. Now, what other pigments do we have? that could be toxic that you guys know about. Even if you're not buying them. Is that cadmium the only pigments you guys know about? Manganese, toxic one. She said manganese. You, you're going to see a lot of, every company has a manganese blue but it's always a U, because the real manganese blue, where is it? I don't have it here, but the real manganese blue, do you have my sheet? Oh, it's here. I don't know that number by heart. Yellow, orange, red, purple, blue. Manganese blue is taking blue turn true. Now, try to find that on one of you two, PB33. It's, it's an older pigment. There's also manganese black, but it's even more rare. But these pigments, that's a heavy metal, that's toxic. I'm also, oh, there's also <coughs> manganese violet. That's more common. Pigment violet, I think 19. Not 16, I'm sorry. Okay, what other pigment is there that could be toxic? I'm looking for one more family. Well, two more.
Some manufacturers still make the lead white and oil paintings, but there's very few of them. Now, here, I've been mixing pigment, but I didn't start from the dry pigment. I started from something we sell called aqua dispersion. And basically, it's the mix of pigment and water. And uh, it's all organic pigment, so it, you don't have to do this when you want to do water-based media. Now, I use for the binder uh, water-based shellac solution. And that's something I like to talk about in the demo. Can you pass it around? Yes. You guys know shellac, what it is? Shellac? Never heard of it? I have to read the back of it too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Basically, shellac, shellac is a natural resin from India, and it's made by bugs. But it's mainly used in wood finishing uh, to do varnishes. Uh, French polish varnish, you know, is made with shellac. But we sell, so normally you would dilute it in alcohol. It's a resin. Uh, and you dilute it in alcohol, it gives you this or that. This one is what we call de wax shellac, and this one is shellac with the wax. And normally, you use this in furniture. Why I'm talking about it is because we sell a water-based shellac. It's a, it's a special mix, and it's been made water-soluble. And what it does is, it's, uh, we use it as an ink binder. What's the difference between an ink and a watercolor? You guys know? Is it ink made with like dyes instead of pigment? That's a good point, but uh, it could be. Ink sometimes is made from dyes, but in this case, I'm looking for the difference binder size. Pigment. Are considered organic. I'm sorry. Inks are considered organic. Well, actually, the binder is organic because it's shellac, but uh, in this case, it would be fully organic because I've used. Uh, carbazole violet, which is an organic pigment. Uh, but um, basically, I'm looking for something else. What's the difference between a watercolor and an ink? Density? <laughs> could be density. It could be, but that could be the difference between anything, you know, because you can water it down and different companies make different densities. Okay. Inks are generally regarded as transparent, that's true. Uh, however, it's not only that. And then the smell different, like ink, if you smell it directly, you're like, <laughs> it, it has a weird smell, right? Like. Thank you, yeah. Not this one, though. Yeah. Basically, ink are um, non-resoluble, and oh, watercolor okay. will be resoluble. That's the basic. Everything else you said was true, though. But it's basically non-resoluble. And what I like about this product, and the reason I'm talking about it is a lot of you guys are working with uh, maybe oil paintings, and sometimes in the first layers, we need to water the paint down with turpentine and everything and do the sketch. Well, with this, you can just make an underpainting out of uh, water-based ink on your canvas, and then you can oil paint over the top because the two of them combine very well, or you can make painting with that as well. It's super inexpensive, and still you're going to get very, very, very nice, vivid colors. A small bottle of water-based shellac like I have, you know, is the price is on, but it's, it's pretty inexpensive, and that's the small size. You can buy the big size. So in Montreal, I have many oil painters that start their canvas, you know, with lots of water, pigment dispersion and ink binder, and they just splash it on and sketch and place everything, and then they finish in oil paint. So that way they're ridding the solvents. They are not using the solvents in their oil painting, so better health for them and everything like that. So to make inks, water-based shellac. And in this case, I've used pigment dispersion, which is the pigment already in the water, so I don't have to do the part that I just did. If I wanted to make acrylic, I brought the binder here. It's acrylic binder. 
And how would I do it? How much would I use? The one I have is acrylic modeling paste, so it has some chalk inside, so the color will be opaque. But it's the same, if you want to make clear acrylics, you just use a clear binder. But how would I do? What did you want? This is ink, watercolors, and now I want to make acrylic. To make acrylic, I use acrylic polymer, acrylic medium for my binder. How can I do it? To mix the pigment, how much should I use? What's the density of the acrylic? <laughs> Let's find out. Yellow ochre? Normally, with yellow ochre, I shouldn't have any problem with anything, right? Because it's heavy and has to go in the water. So I'm just going to mix it straight, like that. I'm just picking the pigment up. It's going in. <laughs> two spatulas to clean one and the other. The last. Now, you were saying how much pigment I should use. This is how much. I'm just going to put it here. And if I want to use more, I can just add more. So it's basically as much as you wanted? Yeah. Basically, my, my answer to this is always going back to Dada. Dada was making his paint, especially when he was bankrupt. After, he didn't have any, anybody to make for him at that time, so he was making. My question to you is this. Do you think Rana or El Greco or any of these guys were weighing everything? No. They, no, not them. When they were, you know, they were just taking the pigment, putting the oil in my ah, and then paint. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And especially nowadays, the pigments we have are micronized. They are very small, which they didn't have back then. What they had back then was very pretty. So. It, it, they don't even get as much color as what we have today. So you just need to mix and have, you know, as much as you want. As long as you have enough binder to make it a deal with. For example, it's not a good idea to have 90% pigment, 10% binder mix. But anything around 50-50 or less is, you know, is a workable. Yes, we had a question. Um, but can you only mix the paste directly when it's, it's the toxic pigment? Uh, when it's the inorganic pigment, because this one was, you know, yeah. wasn't toxic. But yeah, because if I try, I'm going to try with organic pigments, probably because that paste is thicker. Probably it's going to work a little bit. I'm going to do it right away. I just want to add more pigment and put it next to. Sometimes when you put too much pigment into the binder, you'll see that it's very difficult to thin it. So it becomes really intense, and so you might want to sort of experiment and see how much you want it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Unless you want it really, really dense, which could be really nice as well. We could uh, take a break at some point. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're ready. Yeah, let's take a break, and when I come back, we're going to mm -hmm. do with the organics and going to talk about pigments versus dyes. Okay. So, um, by the way, if you want to make a color, color sketch, you know, like she said, watercolor, water-based shellac, just a little pigment, and uh, it doesn't have to be the drawing. That's something that, you know, 
too often we go like, we want to do paintings, paintings, paintings. But, you know, sometimes it happens in the sketch too. You know, we find our ideas so when we do get the painting, we're warmed up and we know the composition and everything and we try the different color matches. Because it's kind of ugly when you're looking at a painting and it actually shows that the person has been doing like seven layers and, you know, before you got it right. You know what I mean? Anyway. But, so, pigments. One thing I wanted to talk to you about with pigments is pigment versus dye. What's the difference? You said like paints are made from dyes and you work in a paint company. Well, I work at Rowan Home Garden Paint Department. It's not like I work <laughs> for any big paint company. I just know lots of stuff about how to paint. Yeah, but... Yeah. Well, I know that what goes with how to paint is dye and not pigment. I know, I'll paint this.